Folks, it's Tuesday, day three of the Winer Wellness Week here at the World of Wellness. And we had the rookie sensation up last hour. Now we have the anchor. I'm not going to call him the veteran. I'm going to call him the anchor because he's not that old. So the veteran, the anchor, it doesn't matter. The guy's been here since the inception of this wellness center. And there's a reason for that. You're going to hear about it right now. Today's workshop, Dr. Gideon Orbach. And I, I'm a little bit, uh, just a little bit surprised and amused that he has a little bit of notes today because usually he just stands up here with his brain. But, you know, a little bit of notes isn't going to hurt anybody. Doc? I, I hope not. Take Thanks it away, bro. Intro. All right. Um, before we get started, I'd like everybody who's physically present and physically capable and for those of you at home who are listening in, if you're physically capable of doing this, please do so. And, and before we start with the program today, what I want everybody to do is to stand up and I want you to spread your feet to wider than shoulder widths apart. And I want you to raise your arms up overhead like a capital Y. This is an I, this is a T, this is a Y. So we are reaching for the spot where the ceiling and the wall meet at 180 degrees to our body with our feet spread, legs spread wider than shoulder width apart. And we're just taking up all the physical space that we can. And I'm imagining that people out in the crowd are starting to feel a little bit of fatigue in their shoulders from holding their arms up. And don't worry, we're not gonna do this for much longer. Live with your fatigue for three, two, one, one, two, three. All right, have a seat, please. Thank you very much. So, I guess the big question is, why did we just do that? And we'll get there. Thank you for the warm introduction, Joe. Uh, my name is Gideon Orbach. I practice chiropractic. Uh, I hold the uh, prestigious title of DC, Doctor of Chiropractic. And I also have a relatively new set of initials called PSP. I'm a primary spinal practitioner. That was uh, the result of going to Pitt for, um, in 2018, 2019 and even into the early stages of 2020, uh, the University of Pittsburgh Physical Therapy Department started a new program that's open to chiropractors and physical therapists. It's the first program of its kind in the country that includes both those professions in order to uh, um, really let's better understand physical rehabilitation and what chiropractors are doing that physical therapists can learn from and what are physical therapists doing that chiropractors can learn from. And for those of you that don't know, I bleed blue and gold. Uh, I've, I've mildly, mildly flatlined for a moment or two at the performance of the Pitt men's basketball team this year, but it's, it's going to be okay. So I've been in practice for over 20 years, uh, 14 and a half and counting of them have been here at this facility. I was with Dr. Weiner on the south side at the pain release clinic. Uh, when we moved to this building here in Green Tree, which is, was in October of 2008, uh, we rebranded ourselves or renamed ourselves the uh, Weiner Wellness Center. And in February of last year, when uh, Jamie Dorley took over uh, operations, ownership, management, and generally speaking, being in charge, renamed it to the world of wellness. So uh, um, I know where the bodies are buried. Been here a while. Just kidding. There are no bodies buried. Uh, but be that as it may, I've also had the chance to practice in uh, New York City. I've had the chance to practice in uh, um, the Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. I practice in the West Indies. I practice in Jamaica uh, for a period of time. And I don't think that in the last 20 years I have traveled anywhere to any other city, any other state uh, out of the country without adjusting somebody on my travels. So uh, the principles that I use, uh, um, they work everywhere. They work everywhere. People's general physiology is pretty much the same everywhere I've been. So there are no special secrets. There's just uh, the practice of chiropractic, and it's uh, applicable in all places. I went to school in um, originally to get my D.C. degree before the PSP in Kansas City, Missouri. The school has since moved to Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, but I went in the early... Uh, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And, and as a student, I did over 700 hours of continuing education over a four year period uh, in the field of biomechanics, uh, advanced chiropractic adjusting technique, uh, a little bit of nutrition, a lot of neurology, a lot of rehab, a lot of extremity adjusting. And, and for context, 
you got to do uh, 24 hours of continuing education in two years to support your Pennsylvania license to practice. So to do 704 years, if you're doing some math, that means that two to three weekends a month, I was at a workshop or I was taking a, a class that wasn't on the curriculum because I was fortunate. I learned very, very early in my career as a chiropractic student who I wanted my mentors to be and how I wanted to practice and what I wanted it to look like and who the people were who I wanted to learn from. And if that meant getting in my, here's a big plug. If that meant getting in my Subaru, which uh, made it to over 200,000 miles of travel between Kansas City and Davenport and Dallas and St. Louis and, and Minneapolis and trips to Cincinnati to meet with and to network with people and to study what they were teaching, that Subaru was a great car. And I, uh, I put a lot of mileage on and a lot of study outside of school to learn the techniques that, um, that I use and the principles that I employ. In fact, just a few months ago, one of my former classmates was uh, on a road trip and she stopped by to visit us here at the Wellness Center and I adjusted her and she awarded me a zero growth award. I was a little, I was a little offended, but she said, well, that's because you do exactly what you did when you were a student. You haven't changed the way you practice. She begrudgingly told me I'm better at it now, but uh, I've been doing the same thing for that long. So I asked her if she would change my zero growth into a, a hundred percent consistency which she uh, um, which she agreed to. So anyhow, I mentioned that I had practiced here at the this particular group ever since it was a pain release on the uh, the south side to uh, world of wellness and everything in between currently. And, and we've been we've been remarkably consistent about what we've done over the years and how we've treated our patients and the things that we look for and and I'm proud to say the ethical above board principles that we apply in all stages of our business and our clinical apparatus and, and, and in every way, shape or form. But we're always, always looking to grow and we're always looking to bring in more modalities and new strategies in which we can treat uh, our patients, our population with upgraded new information, new reference and, and research information that is. And we always want to do more. So earlier in this Wellness Week, we had a, a visiting professor, a doctor from Florida, Dr. Kathleen, who came to uh, talk to us about hormones and uh, peptides. And now amongst our clinical staff, for those of us who, uh, who had a chance to talk with her behind the scenes and understand what it was that she was doing, like we're salivating at the chance to bring that into our clinic. And we're looking to bring in new practitioners and, and all I can say is just spicy deliciousness. I mean, what she introduced us to and uh, um, the new stuff that we're going to be able to bring in as chiropractors, we don't have a time frame. We have to put in the infrastructure. But I just want to illustrate how we as a group are constantly growing and trying to add more and yet remain as consistent as possible and stay within our, our parameters. So before I get into too much more, uh, I have a stock question that I like to ask whenever um, I'm doing a workshop or hosting a, a, one of these chats at the Wellness Week. And, and that's very simply, what's your idea of being healthy? What's your definition of health? Is there, is there anybody sitting around here visiting with us live? Or if you're on our Facebook Live and you can type into the feed, uh, we have IT savant Phil over here monitoring the keyboards and the screens and, and all that. So. Uh, um, if anybody has a definition of the word health that they would like to share as a concept, I invite you to join and make this interactive. Yes, please. Being able to do what you did in your 30s and still do it in your 70s. Being able to do what you did in your 30s and to do it well while you approach 70. I think that's a, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't cuss online, can I? <laughs> that, that's a great answer. That is a fantastic answer. But I'll do you one better. How about doing it even better as you approach 70? That'd be even better. Well, when I, when I think about, let's, let's drill down on that. And when I think about that answer, there's an element of, of anti-aging. So anti-aging means that we're, we, we have been doing things to take care of our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial health all along the journey from about 30 to about 70. It doesn't happen with waving a magic wand that we can say, 
I mean, there is a magic. What is it? Alakazam, Alakazam. And, and we're going to turn back the hands of time. But if you're a healthy person, should be able to be active, assertive, uh, participating, uh, accomplishing and achieving at any age of life. And, and we would certainly like to say, you know, the things I did at 30, I'm understanding of who I am, what I'm about, my priorities, how my body works, how my brain works. I'm even better at that than now. As, as, as I elaborate on that, do you feel like I still have captured the essence of your answer? Yeah. And plus, mm -hmm. services here are to help make an amendment. Yes. This lady, this, this lady just put herself on payroll. Her answer is your services here have helped me tremendously. I, I, I promise you all, this is not a plant. <laughs> I this place when I was 30, I, I did fantastic. You seem to be doing fantastic, right? Okay. Okay. All right. So my definition of the word health is this. Having the ability to recognize, interact with, adapt to, and overcome your environment, both internally and externally. So we got to have a certain level of awareness of, of what's going on around us to maintain our safety. I mean, at the, very, at the very least, at the very, very least, look over your shoulder when you're merging in traffic or changing lanes to avoid getting into an accident. I mean, you got several tons of vehicle that could potentially collide with, each, with one another and create a fantastic bodily injury for everybody involved that could all be avoided if somebody would just look, right? So we gotta be uh, uh, aware and be able to recognize our external environment as to what's going on. We have to be able to adapt to it. Oh, there's a car coming. I won't merge now. I'll wait. And we're going to overcome it. Hey, look, there's an opening. I'm going to slide my car right into traffic and proceed as planned from the very get-go. My external environment. My internal environment is a little bit different. That's the chemistry, the neurochemistry, the immune system, the digestive system, the neurotransmitters, the, the hormones, the peptides. The, the way my body assimilates mag and utilizes magnesium amongst every other nutrition, nutritional supplement, every nutritional metabolite I can think of. That's what's going on in my internal environment, whether I'm aware of it or not. So far, so good. Questions, comments, moral outrages? All right. So when, when I think about my approach to a patient, we're going to meet at the very beginning and it all begins with a conversation. What can I do for you? What did you come here expecting to get out of our time together? What do you expect to get out of your experience at the world of wellness? What can I do to help you meet those expectations? Maybe even get beyond those expectations. So we're gonna have a conversation and we're gonna talk about people's individual specific concerns. We're gonna talk about what can we realistically expect to be able to do for them. We're going to talk about what kind of a standard they can hold us to. And quite frankly, we're going to talk about what kind of a standard we hold them to. There's no chiropractic police. I will not come to your house to make sure you're doing your exercises. I will not come to your house to make sure that you're taking your supplements. I will not come to your house to make sure that you're doing anything else that we talked about or not doing things that we talked about as the case may be. But if you want to have a successful treatment plan, and if we agree upon some certain set of expectations, you, uh, you got to be a little bit of accountable to yourself. And being a chiropractic patient is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world because you actually have to show up. You actually have to be physically here to have your appointment. You have to be accountable to yourself to do, we're going to try and keep it to a bare minimum, but we're going to give you a minimum amount of homework and a minimum, a minimum amount of responsibility. And, and quite frankly, you have to like yourself enough to take on that responsibility. We're going to keep it to a minimum, but we're going to expect you to do your part just as you should expect me to do my part. So what is my part? Uh, my techniques include doing chiropractic adjustments. I use my hands uh, um, more than 99% of the time. I have a very few patients who have very specific circumstances where I use a device to adjust them, uh, uh, partially at their request, partially at my good judgment, 
uh, partially because it's just it's just going to simply go better if if we use more focused but less force to to make these adjustments and manipulations. But those people are few and far between. First of all, I'm using my hands to make adjustments to the to the spine and to the extremities. I've done a lot of work both as a student and then as a professional. And now I've reached a point in my career where I'm doing work as a teacher and helping other young chiropractors learn how to adjust uh, extremities. That means feet, knees, hips, uh, hands and wrists, elbows and shoulders, rib cage, collarbones. Those are big ones. This is very important. So I'm using my hands for those treatments. Uh, I do trigger point muscle release, certainly not as well as Jacob or Adam, our since retired muscle and Herman, our since retired muscle therapy guys. We have a new muscle therapist named Andrea. She's absolutely phenomenal. I wouldn't for a second pretend to be as good at this as she is, uh, but I do employ a little bit of muscle release. Uh, the third technique or the third principle that I use is what's called active isolated stretching, also known as peripheral neurofacilitated stretching, which means that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch somebody. I'm going to push somebody's arm further and further back, and then they're going to push forward against my pressure, and then I'm going to be able to stretch their arm even further backwards in order to open up, create mobility in shoulders, in hips, allow the rib cage to fully expand just a little bit more so that people can breathe even deeper. So my first shameless plug was for my beloved Subaru. My second shameless plug was for Dr. Kathleen and the spicy deliciousness that she's introducing us to. And my third shameless plug is for the powders. I'm drinking a combination of um, the Beet Elite powder along with the Power Fuel, which is a nutritional frontiers uh, energy boosting. And it's, of course, all blended with uh, my favorite drink, which is water, because... Well, I don't really speak that much. I'm not a big talker. My voice needs more exercise. I don't do this often. And now my voice is tired. So I have great stuff to fuel my pumps, pump my heart, and, uh, and liquefy my throat so I can keep going. So these techniques that I use, why would I do this? Why would anybody want to devote their career to doing spinal and extremity adjustments, stretching hips and shoulders, digging a fingertip, a thumbprint, or even an elbow into a trigger point? Well, for one... We support better brain-body communication. That's the most important thing. That's the top of the checklist. I want you to think about your brain as a, a relay station. We talked about recognizing your environment, both internally and externally. Well, what does recognizing your environment mean? That means that you're taking in environmental information, eating a hot dog chock full of nitrates, and who knows what other kind of undefined chemicals, and how are they going to affect your internal environment. That's information. I'm putting information into my mouth. I'm letting it fall down through my esophagus into my stomach where it's going to be shaken but not stirred and bathed in acid so it can be broken into.
stronger the contraction will be. So if I want to, if I want to pick up a hundred pounds off the floor, I'm going to bend down and, and, and like my, my, my back isn't strong enough to lift that up by itself. I'm, who am I kidding? I want to use my whole body to lift this up. So this, this giant weight, I'm going to get close to it. I'm going to bend down. I'm going to be close to it. And I'm going to use mostly my legs and mostly my, the muscles of my hips and just a little bit. My back is not lifting the weight. My back is stabilizing my body as I lift up to keep myself upright. We're back live. Good. So while we were having this brief time out, we were talking about stretching and how important it is and, and always the why, always the why. So I've lifted, I've been able to lift this weight and I've, I've, I, I think this is heavy. I mean, we're going to go to the powerlifting gym and these guys are going to look at me and like you wimp and somebody's going to pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down just to show off. We're going to go over to uh, uh, some other place where people do other things. And they're going to, my God, you lifted that all by yourself? That's incredible. So context is everything. But we decided that this is a heavy weight. The more flexible I am, the more the length I have in the muscles of my hamstrings and my quadriceps, my glutes around my hips, the stronger my contraction is going to be. So that way, if I want to turn this 100 pounds into something that's light for me, that I, I can pick it up and put it down, pick it up and put it down, I want to have stronger muscle contractions. So I'm going to achieve that through flexibility. Now, because a flexible muscle has greater contractile ability, it also has less likelihood of being injured. So stretching has an element of preventiveness in the sense like, I don't, I don't want my... I don't want my lower back to be injured. Who does? Who's going to sign up for that? So by keeping the musculature of your lower back in specific, your body in general, long, lean, flexible, bendable, pliable, it takes a greater impact or a greater threshold or a greater uh, repetitive movement in order to create that injury. Uh, it's okay to hang. Okay. Well, the inversion table is a more sophisticated way of hanging. Uh, um, the, I think the inversion tables are excellent in terms of uh, um, stretching out your spine and, and allowing your discs, the spinal discs are cushioning. They're, they're fluid-filled shock absorbers. So if the discs are flexible and the load is taken off of them by coming upside down, the disc has a, a chance to replenish itself. So I say a lot of good things about inversion, but I'm going to throw out a caveat. And that is when you're upside down, when you're inverted, there's a huge rush of blood to your head. And most people, actually everybody at a certain point will get a headache from that or a head rush. So I've had entirely too many patients in the past who they've gotten an inversion table because they heard how good it was. On day one, they flipped themselves 180 and they stayed there for too long for their own metabolic capability. And they got a head rush, decided the inversion table wasn't for them. And now it's for sale cheap. So I'll, I'll find you a cheap inversion table, <laughs> but, but, uh, um, I would caution everybody that like, don't go upside down, go to, if you're lying flat, if we call that 180 degrees and upside down will be zero, why, why don't you go to 160 on the first day and, and want live there? I mean, that's, that's your zone. And after you've been doing it for a couple of weeks, further and further down. You're, you're doing the same thing for your spine in terms of promoting flexibility. You're just stretching different muscles in different directions uh, uh, with the two. So, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we're back, we're back like flowing through space with, uh, um, all right. So anyhow, we, we talked briefly uh, about why somebody would want to do the chiropractic techniques that I, I do. We started that conversation with supporting better brain-body communication. So what I, what I want to make sure everybody understands is that I, I don't do bone out of place. I, I understand that there are a lot of ch chiropractors out there who x-ray their patients, point to uh, um, structural misalignments, and, and say, we need to do... 10 or 12 adjustments this month, probably a similar amount next month. And what we're going to do is we're going to make your x-ray look absolutely beautiful. And we're going to restore all these uh, alignments and, and make your, your spine look exactly like the textbook said that it should. Um, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I'm more a functionalist 
than I am a structuralist. So we have a bone out of place model, which means that we're changing the architecture of uh, somebody's skeleton. Not interested in that. And I'll pose you this question as a thought question. If, um, if you've been living in your body for your whole life, whether you're 16 or 30 or 70, and we change the architecture of it, are we really helping you? I, I don't know. It's, it's debatable. There's, there's, no, there's no true, well-recognized answer to that question. What I'm interested in is the movement pattern of the skeleton. For example, if you could imagine a row of dominoes, and I tap one at the bottom, and it knocks the next one over, and that knocks the next one over, and so forth and so forth, we have a... Um, we have a wave. We have the dominoes moving like a wave. And I want the spine to move the exact same way in the sense that I'm going to push on your sacrum and I'm going to push hard enough to get it to trigger movement in the bone above it and the one above that and then so forth and so forth. And places where that wave-like movement is missing, then that's where we're going to start to apply chiropractic adjustments. We're going to look at the way the scapula, the wing bone, the angel's wing, how does it float on the rib cage? Can we get that scapula to rock side to side? And if not, which muscles are holding it up? Why is this not happening? Where am I going to strategically place a thumb or an elbow in order to release tight muscles? Where am I going to apply a chiropractic adjustment in order to get the rib cage to lift up, taking the shoulder blade scapula with it and let it set it back down in concert with how the patient is breathing so we can restore normal side-to-side -side glide sc scapulothoracohumeral rhythm to get those bones to move. And we do the exact same thing. We look at feet, knees, elbows, shoulders. We know exactly how the body is supposed to move. We analyze what it's not doing or what it might be doing too much of. And then we start to do techniques to, uh, um, to relax tight muscles, to take load off of the tendons, and to get the skeleton to move the way it's supposed to. Now, in between bones, in between joints of the body, we have very specialized nervous tissue called pressure-sensitive mechanoreceptors. Uh, um, well, they're pressure-sensitive, so that means if one bone is pushing into another bone or if one bone is stuck with another bone or they're not moving freely with one another, we're increasing the pressure on these very sensitive pieces of neurological tissue. And if we do that, those, that specific neurological tissue, the pressure-sensitive joint mechanoreceptors, are going to send information into the brain, which is going to say, we have pain going on here, we're stuck, I need some protection. So protection is going to come in the form of recruiting all the muscles in the area to tighten up and to spasm and begin an immune system process, which includes inflammation. And, and the brain is going to learn this and interpret it as becoming normal. And that's the cycle we want to break up. So the treatment plan for uh, uh, chiropractic in our office, both with myself and with Dr. Phil, who spoke so eloquently uh, just before me, just prior to my workshop, is we want to get stuck joints to move through their proper ranges of motion and beyond in order to excite the central nervous system, the brain, and get it to understand that that, that, that tight spasm adhes cycle is not normal. It's the pattern we want to break, and we want to influence uh, uh, that whole sequela of events with chiropractic adjustments, supportive muscle tendon, uh, trigger point type of release, and specific stretching. So that's, that's, that is, in a nutshell, what I do and why. Uh, we want to increase people's ranges of motion. We find that when our patient population has uh, a better adjusted skeleton and more relaxed uh, muscle tissue, they have a, a better balance, better position awareness, uh, better position in space. Why? Because the brain is doing a more comprehensive and appropriate job of talking to all of the supportive joints, to the skeleton, to the muscle, placing ourselves in a position of, advantage, of advantage. So if we're placing our position, ourselves in a position of advantage, we are certainly better likely to recognize, interact with, adapt to, and even overcome our environments, certainly externally. What relationship does that have to the internal environment? Well, two things that I'm really specifically interested in are people's posture and people's ability to breathe. At the very, very beginning of our, before I even introduced myself, I asked everybody to stand in that feet out wider than shoulder position, arms up in a capital Y position. And what are we doing here? Well, we're going to get, I'm going to throw out a teaser because I'm going to have another chance to talk to the crowd on Friday morning 
We're going to go into much more detail about this. But for the time being, let's look at this and let's break it down. How could I possibly, how could I possibly not be in good posture? This is, this is very, I'm reaching for the spot where the ceiling and the wall meet. I have no choice but to keep my head up and, and look up what I'm doing. And as soon as my head comes down, I'm not reaching for that spot anymore. I am stretching my head up toward the ceiling if I can get there. This is, forces me into ideal posture. So once again, teaser, we're going to go into detail and drill down on that much more on Friday morning. But for now, this is the posture that we want to be in. If your posture is good, that means that what you're doing is you're using your skeleton and your muscles to support yourself and to move yourself in proper mechanical advantage the way that you're designed to. So what if, I, if I'm a sloucher? If, if, I'm, if I'm this person, I'm going to work harder to move through space. I'm going to, uh, um, I'm going to not be able to, I'm going to be unable to take the deepest possible breath that I want to for my own, uh, um, my own advantage. I'm going to start using my body in such a way that's going to create muscle spasms because I'm using my joints and my muscles to move on planes that I'm not supposed to be on. And they're going to fight. I'm going to literally be fighting with myself to get my physical work, my physical exertion done. So once again, we want to reiterate how important good posture is. And the other thing we want to talk about is how important that uh, uh, my deep breathing is. Now, what I see time and time and time again, over again, not, not a day goes by that I don't see this, is that people have their heads cranked kind of forward like they're leading with their nose, trying to break the ticker tape parade uh, stripe. And they're using, consequently, they're tightening up all these muscles here uh, um, and using them as a pulley system to lift their rib cage up to help themselves breathe. Now, I'm grossly over-exaggerating for the purposes of illustration, but what we're doing is using what are called the accessory, mus accessory musculature of respiration, your sternocleidomastoid and that gang that attach to your collarbone to pull your rib cage up to get a deep breath you're getting a fraction of the amount of oxygen that you could possibly get by using these muscles instead of your diaphragm. So posture will absolutely influence your ability to breathe. So let's work on this a little bit together. First of all, good posture. Uh, what I want everybody to do is to sit up as straight and tall as they can or stand up as straight as tall as you can. And we're going to talk about two areas of the body right here at my, at my belt buckle. And right here, where my chest ends and my abdomen begins, and what I want to do is I want to be as tall or as long as I possibly can in this, in this area of my body. So what's happening is I'm really lifting my chest and throwing my shoulders back, even at a subconscious, subconscious level, when I make myself as long and tall as I can here. The second thing I want to think about is I have a string from the ceiling coming down to the top of my head, lifting me up. So when you go to the doctor's office and they measure your height, we all want to be as tall as we possibly can. So think about that spot. That's the highest spot on the top of your head and try and lift it up and push it towards the ceiling. So long in the, tour, long in the abdomen, head is up. And because I went long here, I don't even have to think about my shoulders. They just, they have no choice but to rotate backwards and to sink down right where I want them. So what I'm going to do here when I'm in my ideal posture is I'm going to take a deep breath in through my nose. And what I'm going to do is I'm not, I'm not moving my shoulder blades up. I'm allowing them to remain down and sank. So my abdomen is expanding. My chest is getting big as I fill up with oxygen. And I'm going to blow out through my mouth. What I'm not going to do is shrug my shoulders all the way up. I'm just allowing them to sink. And if anything, if anything, I might even be shrugging them down further. So let's take a couple deep breaths together. Everybody's long in the torso. Everybody is head is up, reaching for the ceiling. And we're going to inhale through our noses. Our abdomens are expanding. Our chest cavities are expanding. And we're holding for 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And let's all blow out through our mouths. Again, big deep breath in through our nose. Torso expansion without torso reach, and blow out through your mouths. One more time, big deep breath in. Whole thing is getting big. Hold, hold, hold some more. 
and blow out through your mouths. Now, normally in a pre-COVID world, we had a great big crowd and people are here live and we're doing this together. And I'm teasing some people who start to feel a little bit lightheaded doing this. Uh, so if you're playing along with me and having a good time with this at home and you start to feel lightheaded, well, why is that? Well, you're just simply not used to getting that much air into you. And it only took three, de three deep breaths to expose that. So uh, um, I'm not sure if the, the ladies up front circulated the, the flyer or not, but there was that place where you're supposed to like prick your finger and put a little drop of blood promising to do exactly what I'm suggesting. You guys all get that handout? No, I guess not. Um, so what, I, what I'd like though is for everybody who's listening in, please, three deep breaths in good posture in a row, at least three times a day, bare minimum, bedrock minimum, three times a day, and watch what starts to change for you. You get to start to uh, breathe freer and easier. You're gonna start to make postural changes, and it's gonna be one step towards living more comfortable, comfortably in your body. Now, I listed off all the reasons why uh, I do what I do and why my patients come to see me. You'll notice that the word pain never once came out of my, my mouth. Uh, that I'm not, I'm not treating patient, patients because they're in pain. I'm treating patients because they're having push-pull, aberrant relationships in their own body. They're having asymmetrical overloads with muscle, joints, tendon, push-pull relationships. I'm treating patients because their posture has allowed to sink down. I'm treating patients because they're short of breath and they're practically panting and gasping for air. And you add up all of those factors and you're depriving your brain so many opportunities to produce feel-good chemicals and instead telling your brain to start to produce lactic acid, influence your nervous system because inflammation is building up. And those are the people that I treat. And, and I, I see... Uh, um, I see, I don't know, maybe 65 patients a week, 70 is really pushing it. 50 means, you know, don't you people like me anymore? Uh, um, and of that group, my single highest patient population demographic are people who they came to see me once upon a time because they were in pain. And instead of rubbing some magic wand or some of the body part that hurts the most, so we're just going to keep adjusting that until it feels better. We never did that. We took a whole body head to toe approach and started moving the skeleton in its preordained uh, movement patterns. We started doing work to release the muscles that were preventing the skeleton from moving that way. We started influencing the brain to start producing more uh, uh, feel good chemicals. And all of a sudden their aches and pains, whether it was in their shoulder or their knee or wherever in their body or their lower back, all of a sudden those aches and pains started to go away. And now what they do, what that huge demographic of people do is they come and see me Maybe it's once a month, maybe it's once a quarter. Uh, for a couple people I have in mind, it's once or twice a week. General maintenance, I've had no falls. I've had no accidents. I feel okay, and I know that the jump from feeling okay to feeling good is an easy one to make, but the one from feeling I hurt to okay, man, that takes a lot of work and some time and some effort, and I'm going to give you homework, and they don't want their homework. They don't want that I just... I'm not doing well sensation. So they come in for maintenance from time to time. And, and my patients do a really good job of buying into my message and what I'm trying to explain. And like, we don't, we, we don't treat people because they're in pain. We treat people and we hope that along the way we can rid them of their pain as quickly as possible by correcting the, the mechanics of their, um, of their world. So let's see. Um, another shameless plug for a delicious drink. And I want to talk about one of the most common conditions that I see. Something, not, not a day goes by, not one single day goes by when I don't uh, see a patient who complains to me about acid reflux, heartburn, a lot of bloating in their stomach, difficulty swallowing food, uh, their food or their pills get caught in their throat, they have a raspy or a fatigued voice, maybe a metallic taste in their mouths. So here's what's happening. We have a tube. It begins at the entrance and it concludes at the exit. The tube in our back of our mouth is called our esophagus. It's flexible. It's bendable. It travels down the length of the torso, passes through the diaphragm muscle into what's called the lower esophageal sphincter muscle. That lower esophageal sphincter muscle is a one-way valve. It prevents stomach contents from washing up. 
As soon as that tube passes by that lower esophageal sphincter muscle, same tube changes names and there's this out pouching called the stomach. The stomach is, it's vibrating or it's churning or it's even shaking just a little bit. And the stomach is chock full of acid. So when you put pills or food or drink or what have you into your mouth, it slides down through the esophagus, through the valve-like muscle, and it gets to the stomach where it's dissolved in acid, broken up into smaller little chunks. And then the food substance continues. It's now it's called a bolus. The bolus continues its journey through the stomach in the same tube into the intestinal tract where we start to uh, absorb the nutrients and where we uh, um, begin the process of elimination. Now, because the stomach is vibrating or because it's churning or because it's in motion, it has the ability to be pushed up or to drift upwards. If that stomach drifts up high enough, it will get itself lodged, the very top will lodge itself in that lower esophageal sphincter muscle, which essentially disables the valve. And now what happens is stomach contents, which largely include acid, are able to wash up into the esophagus, creating a burning sensation. That, that chemistry, that, that, that acid can wash up even higher yet, and it'll end up interfacing with the vocal cords, and people will tell me that they have a raspy or a fatigued voice. If that acid washes up high enough, they'll have a metallic taste in their mouths. And, and dentists, dentists catch this all the time. People have an acid buildup in the spot in the mouth at the bottom where it will interface the back of the bottom row of teeth. And people have this huge excessive tartar acid buildup on the back of their lower teeth in the front. And, and the, the dentist will start quizzing them and find out that they actually should be diagnosed with some sort of acid reflux disease. Now, because the esophagus itself is a flexible tube, the stomach comes up and it pushes into the esophagus. So the esophagus will bend or it'll kink along the way. And, and that way, there's this spot where we have a curvy pathway and food will get caught, pills will get caught, and those patients will tell me they have a difficult time swallowing. Now, if that stomach comes up even higher, even higher than that lower esophageal sphincter muscle, and it gets itself lodged in the diaphragm muscle, the diaphragm is very loosely the bottom of the chest, uh, the top of the abdomen, now it has a name. It's called a hiatal hernia. So most common condition that I see are people who have, at the very least, lower esophageal sphincter uh, um, in, impingement with their stomach or a herniation of the stomach into the lower esophageal sphincter. If not, it's come up high enough into the diaphragm muscle. So what do we do about that? Well, one, we make an adjustment to the rib cage like so, so we can get their, their ribs to begin to uh, expand and compress when they breathe normally. We're concerned about everybody's breathing, especially people whose rib cages are literally stuck because there's a competition for space in their bottom of their, their chest cavity. What else do we do for this person? Well, we push, we literally, literally push their stomach down and we get it to come unstuck from the, uh, uh, possibly from the diaphragm, certainly from the lower esophageal sphincter, to be able to restore normal stomach mobility, vibration, or churning. So why do I go off on this tangent explaining this condition? Well, one, uh, I'm gonna see, I see multiple people every single day who have this. So if, if you're listening in and this applies to you, uh, maybe Dr. Phil or myself will be able to help you. Two, it's a postural problem. If I am doing something that compresses my chest into my abdomen, what am I doing? I'm forcing my stomach to basically move out of the way, and where is it going to go? It's going to get caught in that lower esophageal sphincter muscle. So we talk about people who are uh, uh, more on this. On, here's another shameless plug and a teaser for what we're going to do on Friday, but we're going to talk a little bit more about work and working at home and building your own workstation and, and how you can do this appropriately for yourself. But I'm compressing myself by sitting at my desk, by uh, um, sitting in my car, maybe by the poor technique I use in weightlifting or poor technique in yoga class, uh, uh, maybe because my posture is just off. And I'm this person, so I'm compressing my diaphragm into my stomach, literally creating the most common condition that uh, uh, we see here in this particular chiropractic clinic. So let's see. We talked a little bit about me and my background, which uh, is extremely exciting to me, but I hope I didn't bore the rest of you uh, along the way. 
Uh, we talk about what it is that I'm doing here uh, and to a large extent also what Dr. Phil Ross is doing here because you know we were talking about uh, just clinical philosophy with Dr. Kathleen who's introducing us to spicy, delicious new things uh, that we're going to be implementing in our, in our clinic involving hormones, peptides, and anti-aging at some point in the future. Um, and, and through the whole conversation, I've been practicing with Dr. Phil for less than a year, but I feel like I've known him and worked with him for years, maybe decades, because we're so in sync and on the same page philosophically of our approach to how this should be done. So when we talk about this, this poor digestion, acid reflux, heartburn, uh, metallic taste in the mouth and so forth, uh, um, that's, uh, um, most common thing we see here, but it's a, to a large extent, it is a preventable condition by maintaining good posture, especially this component in your abdomen, keeping your chest and your belt buckle as far apart as you possibly can with this particular stretch here. So we talked about, uh, what it is that I'm doing here. We talked about, uh, always the why we talked about what we're looking to grow into and add into our battery of services for the future. Uh, we talked about an overall view of what I think it means to be healthy. And over the years, most people have agreed with me that nobody's, nobody's been debating my definition of health. Some people have been adding on to it. Uh, and we talked about really all the things that we have to offer here that can benefit for you. So with that in mind, I'm going to throw out a plug for myself. Friday, we're going to be talking a little bit more about neurology and a little bit more about things that you can do for yourself. And we're going to overemphasize and beat home the deep breathing and, and why this position is such so good to center yourself and get yourself ready to face the world. We're going to talk about a few more techniques that you can apply to yourself for your own well-being. Uh, we're going to talk about workstation a little bit more. We're going to talk about neurology a lot more, and we're going to review some of the things we talked about today with chiropractic. And of course, we're absolutely going to be drinking more beets and uh, uh, power fuel. So if there are any questions, comments, moral outrages, or general points of interest that my live crowd wants to bring out, or my friends on Facebook want to type in that IT Savant Phil can um, um, relay to me, now would be a great time for that. Otherwise, going, yes. You drink reds a lot. Really I do. I do. I'm an equal opportunity kind of guy. The, the, the point, IT, IT savant Phil, like, I love this guy. He's, he's, he is so good at what he does, and he is not shy to give me a hard time about anything. So, yes, yes, thank you for noticing. I do drink a lot of reds, but I, I'm an equal opportunity. I, I like to get my beats the most underrated superfood out there uh, whenever I get my chance. Do you have like a schedule? Do you drink one, one day, one the other day? I don't know. Well, his, his question is, do I drink one one day and the other the other day if I have a set squ schedule? And, and it's, it's in flux, man. It's, yeah, okay. it's, there's it's flow, flow, total, like, total like flow. Like, right. I feel, like, I feel like sometimes the world just gives me a message yeah. and I have to follow it. And I've just been getting the beat message more and more lately. But that doesn't mean that I won't be drinking reds in abundance. Who knows? Maybe next week. Okay. Don't beets give you nitric oxide? Don't beets give you nitric oxide? Pardon me? I, I'm repeating your question for the benefit oh, of, okay. of the people who, who... Don't beets give you... I mean, I'm getting like thumbs up from Phil. I see, I see uh, Guru Joe Messina uh, in the corner. He... I hope some of you real Pittsburghers are old enough to catch this reference, but Guru Joe is smiling like the butcher's dog. <laughs> and don't beets give you nitric oxide? Um, beets give you the ability to produce nitric oxide. 100% spot on. Eat beets, get more nitric oxide. 100% spot on. I'm just, I just don't want to create the, uh, um, the concept trap. Like, I'm, I'm going to take a bite of this beet and my nitric oxide is going to explode. You're, you're, you're on it. You're not, you're, uh, you're not wrong. Absolutely not. I'm arguing semantics with you. Um, the question is, is the juice better or the powder? Um, in terms of, uh, I'm going to make a real general statement. I mean, I'm sure that people who know a lot more about nutrition can poke some holes in this game. But in general... If you're drinking something, it's going to get into your system faster than if you're swallowing something. So if you're putting beet powder into your water or your 
your, I like almond coconut milk too. Shameless plug for almond coconut milk. But um, um, if you're putting that beet powder into your fluid, you're going to get absorption of the beets quicker than if you just ate the beet. Now, when you cook the beets, you're probably cooking some of the nutrients out, so you're not going to get the same benefit out of it as you would here. But also, the other, the other, you know, let's talk all the pros and cons. If you're taking a beet powder, I would like to very cordially invite you to look at the label of all the ingredients in it, and, and let's make sure there aren't a lot of extras that end in ean, and let's make sure there aren't a lot of sugars in it, unnecessary extra additional sugar added. So, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to pretend for a second, not for a second, that this is the only place to get good, high quality nutrition, but this is the only place where I'm familiar with the products and I can endorse things and say, I take this myself. I make sure that my, I can't give you a better recommendation than I would for mommy. My parents take this, my parents take that. Okay. I make sure that my niece and my nephew eight and 10 take. So, so my recommendations all come from this store because it's what I know. And I'm supremely, supremely confident in the, uh, the Beat Elite product that we carry on our shelves. So if you're shopping elsewhere, all you gotta do is read the label. Anyone or anything else? All right, well in that case, I just wanna thank everybody for their kind attention. Uh, I wanna compliment uh, IT Savant and Phil once again for the way the power went out and he just mass, he was like, flip this, flip that, throw that switch, boom, we're back. Um, and I will uh, look forward to speaking to you guys on Friday. Thanks again.